you need to have the same mental routine going on every time for the your different routines. Now, you might have a different short game routine than you have long game routine, but whatever that is, you're going to do the same thing over and over and over. And then what I teach is that as you do this routine, at the end of the routine, it hits the shot for you. This is The Tournament Code. We appreciate you taking the time to join us, Dr. Mo. As a lot of people know, you're a great sports performance coach based out of Sea Island. But before we dive into that, where we always start with every guest is just how they got into the game of golf. So tell us a little bit about your background, how you got into golf, and then also how you got into sports and performance coaching. Yes, so, I mean, as far as getting into golf, grew up my dad and my granddad both played golf not at a collegiate level or anything but just you know through work very my family was in the car business so i guess it was good to be play golf if you're in the car business then i got an older brother he's three years older uh, he played at duke so i kind of saw what he did and, and we grew up on the golf course in a little town called orangeburg south carolina and so you know could just walk literally across the street and i was on the green of the fifth hole and so it was just access was really easy. You know, a lot of kids in our in our little town played. So it was, you were kind of, I mean, maybe you weren't as cool as the football players and, the, and baseball players, but you were pretty cool. So then as I was doing that, I kind of realized, you know, I enjoyed it, but I didn't know that I wanted to go to the pro level. I wanted to play in college, but so I was getting ready to go to Citadel and play, and my brother goes, hey, I just want to let you know when you go to the Citadel, when you come in, you won't be watching Sports Center." And I'm like, oh, yeah, why not? And he said, well, you won't even have a TV. I said, well, guess what? I ain't going to the Citadel. So <laughs> it was just that easy. So when the Clemson tried to walk on, just wasn't good enough. Uh, Penley didn't need a, you know, number 10 man. And I could shoot about 74, but I couldn't, I couldn't really break 70 on a consistent basis. So that allowed me to study, and then... How I got into performance coaching, I saw this guy on TV kind of around that same time when I was in high school. He worked, he was working with the Utah Jazz. Basically, he was hanging out in the gym with Carl Malone and Stockton, and they were shooting free throws, and they show a scene. This guy gets on a private jet, and he flies from Salt Lake City to the Forum, and then during the game, he's literally sitting on a bench behind the court, I mean, just eating popcorn and drinking a Coke. And I'm like, they're paying this guy? That's ridiculous. And so... That's how I decided kind of what I wanted to do. I didn't really want a job like most young people. And so uh, I was fortunate enough to go to grad school. I went to University of Virginia, and then you finish up doing an internship, which I did in Charlotte at a big orthopedic clinic that worked with UNC Charlotte, Davidson, the Hornets, the Panthers. And then my big break was basically kind of Charles Warren and Lucas Glover were playing on the I guess it was the Nationwide or the Nike Tour back then. And this was like early 2000s, and they both had made it from on tour out or on that tour to the PGA Tour. So we went down to Sea Island for like a almost like a camp to get ready for the West Coast Swing between Christmas and New Year's. And I started talking to the people there. And so then I moved down there in 2005, and that just allowed me a, a home base that was great and allowed me to travel more. And, so then, and then in 2000, I mean, Lucas won in 2005, and when anybody wins, you immediately get smarter, so that helped, but then Zach Johnson won in 2007 at the Masters, and so that was kind of the start of when people started taking notice, I guess, or whatever. So, yeah. That perfectly leads into my next question, because as you said, like, a lot of people might want to be a sports and performance coach, and they might want to have people listen to them, but the thing about having people listen to you is people got to want to listen to you. And so it sounds like some of those wins help people want to listen anymore. At first, what was it like, you know, getting clients and just also learning about your profession? Because, you know, every year, essentially, you're getting smarter and better in your profession. Yeah. So I think I'll take that one first. I mean, you know, when you go to grad school, you learn a lot of theory and, and you get to do a little bit maybe with the high school teams that are around whatever college you're at. And so and I knew golf and I knew the lingo of golf and, and I liked individual sports better than team sports. Not that you have to specialize, but I just thought it was easier working with individuals. And so 
as you go and, and you start trying things and you're talking about, you know, the sport that you know. And so I'm talking about putting routines, which I know some, and then I'm talking about how you practice and you're, you're continuing to develop. I mean, I say things, you know, every month where I'm like, well, I don't know, I'm not sure I've ever said that before. Cause you're always kind of questioning what's the best way to go about it. And, and theory is great, but application always trumps theory. And, and if it can't work in the field, then, you know, it doesn't really work period. So, you know, that, so that was, you know, that's always evolving. And then as far as, you know, I think with, with athletes, I mean, winning promotes winning. And so you just get credibility when you're around people. And so you have to be careful and pick it in people that are going to work hard that you think, you know, have a chance to really perform well, can perform under pressure. Now, when you're starting out, I mean, you can't be picky and choosy, but so, I mean, at least that's how I did it. I, I kind of look at, and I keep a running list to this day on my phone of people that I think I might enjoy working with based on their work ethic and golf, how they treat their caddy, how they treat their instructors, that sort of thing. Because at the end of the day, you're going to spend a lot of time with these people. And, and if it's going to be a good working relationship, then you got to enjoy it. So, yeah. Going back to that, Masters win by Zach Johnson in 2007. What were you guys working on going leading up to that tournament, and what did you learn just from that entire week? Well, I, I would go back to the year before. So we started in 2006, basically at the U.S. Open, and he had been walking in practice rounds with Lucas and Charles prior to that, so I knew him a little bit, and, and I could tell he worked hard, but I didn't think his routines were great, his pre-shot routines. He was a little inconsistent in terms of kind of how he looked at the hole sometimes and how many practice swings he would take and just different things he was doing. And so like one of the, his, the first piece of advice I ever gave Zach was you, you got to quit talking to your caddy when you walk into the ball. Cause he would walk into the ball and as he's walking in, he'd say in and out of the right, which means the winds in and out of the right. And his caddy, you know, basically has to respond to him would say, no, nah, it's more straight in. So what that does is it changes Zach's target. Because if he thinks the wind's in and out of the right versus straight in, he's going to be looking in a different place. So now he's combined his decision-making and his routine, which I never think is a good thing. I think you need to make a decision, be fully confident in that decision and committed to that. And then you start basically your walk into the ball from behind. But if you're already walking in and you're asking questions, you know, invariably you're going to have to change kind of what you're doing or where you're looking and even the shot you're playing in, you know, like, a hard eight versus the easy seven. Well, that changes based on the wind and that kind of thing. So, you know, a lot of that time we spent working on his pre-shot routine and, and that kind of crystallized, if you will. He had a shot in the 2006 Ryder Cup. They were like one up with three holes to go. He was playing with Chad Campbell. I want to say they were playing Padraig Harrington and maybe Paul McGinley. And he was first to hit and, and the other guys were going to go for the green at two. It was kind of this a 16th green guarded by water over in Wales anyway. And he hit this great three with probably the most nervous he's been. And, and that kind of really gave him belief that like, okay, if I do trust this routine, it'll hit the shot for me. And so it's kind of like a light bulb went off that fall. And then a lot of hard work that uh, off season, really working on his wedges because he was already a good driver and a good putter. And, and he was 31 at the time. So it's not like usually your length is, kind of maximized by then, uh, even though, you know, changes in technology can help and all that, but he just wasn't going to get drastically longer. So I'm like, if you're going to beat the best players in the world, Tiger Woods and Phil Mickelson at the time, your wedges have to be elite. So we spent a ton of time that off season doing that. And then obviously that came to fruition. If you want to say, uh, over here in Augusta, where I am right now at the 2007 masters where, you know, is he had great conditions and a lot of things went his way, but he ended up laying up 16 times and making 11 birdies on the par fives. And I mean, that's essentially why he won. So, but that's why we spent a lot of the first years, like it's not one thing like, Hey, this is going to take a lot of practice to build better competence and a skill of hitting your wedges, but it's also going to take kind of changing your own course thinking process so that you're mentally tougher over the ball. It's well documented that he won that Masters by laying up on every par five, 
was that something that you guys decided before the week or was that just kind of how it played out? That was something that we, uh, we didn't decide to lay up on every par five, but he had these predetermined factors, if you will, or, or decisions that had to be met. So there were four things. So it had to be, and at that time, hybrids were just coming around. Cause you gotta remember this is 07. So it had to be an iron. So he wasn't going to go for a green if it was good. So it had to be an iron into the green. The ball had to be sitting good. It had to be on a level lie and the pin had to be in the correct position on the green. And it was really cold that year. The ball wasn't going that far. He got three of the four, I want to say four times, but he never got all four. And so he never went for it. And like, if you go back and watch the coverage on the last day on Sunday, he only had like maybe 205 or something like that, the pin, and maybe 190 something to cover the creek. And, and they're, at the time, you know, I think he was one or two back and they're saying he, he needed to go for it and that sort of thing. But the ball was sitting like a foot and a half above him on a real hard side slope. And so he laid it up and still made a birdie. So, yeah, it wasn't like you're automatically laying up, but it was like these four conditions have to be met before you, you know, decide to go for the green. And he never got them all and he stuck to it. So is that type of conditional strategy something that you practice with a lot of your players or ingrain with them? Yeah. I mean, I don't know that we get that el elaborate with it, to be honest. Um, but definitely, uh, I really kind of teach youngsters that I want them to learn how to pick low stress shots. And so a low stress shot is, is best illustrated almost by example versus just trying to tell you exactly what it is. But a low stress shot is a five iron into the middle of the green instead of a a, a fade four iron to a back right pin or a low stress shot is, you know, just hit a, a bunt driver off the tee instead of trying to, you know, really get an extra three to four yards to cover this bucker. Cause if you don't, it's go, you know, going to lip at a bucker, you know, it's, I mean, I could pull off this shot and hit three wood on the green, but if I don't, I'm gonna have a really hard up and down. So let's just hit seven iron wedge. And so it's, because there's a cost associated with pulling off a high stress shot and you already have enough in any given round. You already have six to seven stressful shots just because physically they're demanding. So everybody can think of like, you know, the tee shot on 18 at TPC or the, the tee shot here at 12 because the wind's swirling and the second shot into 11. I mean, you already get enough stressful shots. You don't need to add to that with your course management. So that's really what I try to kind of teach kids. What are some of the strategies that you use to help players stay disciplined and stick to the game plan like through a tournament? Because, you know, everybody always has a great game plan, but sometimes you might feel like you need to pull something off because you are one shot back, two shots back. But just how do you help players stick to the game plan? The only two times I believe you should ever stick to the game plan would be late on a cut day if, you're, if your event has a cut or late in the entire event where you might have a chance to win. So prior to that or, or any time other than that, you're always just playing the golf course, playing the golf course, playing the golf course, right? But there are times on a Friday where if you're two shots over the cut line, let's say is this week and it's, you know, Friday and you're on the 15th hole at Augusta and you're at a questionable yardage, you probably need to take a chance and go for the green to give yourself a better chance at birdie, especially depending on where the pin position might be, right? And then Sunday, you know, that would be like if I happen to have one of my guys, Zach Johnson or Keegan Bradley, playing well this week, they won't be in contention until we get to the 15th hole on Sunday because contention doesn't exist until that time. You might be leading the tournament on Saturday night or you, you might be in 25th place going off two groups before the leaders. But both of those players in my mind are in the same place, which is they're in position to potentially get in contention, but we won't know who's in contention until we get to basically the second shot on 15. And then we'll see who's within three or four of the lead. I mean, it'll be exciting before that. And, but, but I don't think of contention the same way the media describes that. I mean, the year that Rory, you know, had his first chance over here. I mean, he, he shot like, I don't know, 40 something. It was bad. And he was, he hit it left over there on 10 by the houses, right? He was never in contention, even though he was playing in the final group. 
that's the way I look at it. So, so I think you you come up with a game plan and uh, you're sticking to that game plan and you don't play the event until late on cut day or late in the actual event. But it also means that like, hey, I'm, I'm I have a certain things that I'm gonna do. I'm gonna pick low stress shots. You know, I'm gonna hit whatever club goes to the widest part of this fairway. That could change depending on the wind. So it's not like it's a, always a driver on this hole or it's always a hybrid on this hole. So so you, you have to be aware of course conditions and, and the environment because that can change. But you go out with a mindset of this is how I want to attack that golf course. And unless something happens with the conditions or the weather, I'm not going to change that just based on my score. You know, I'm not going to change that because I'm three over through five. So. Absolutely. One of the things you mentioned about Zach Johnson was that one of the, what you really helped him with was his pre-shot routine. What does a pre good pre-shot routine look like in your mind? A pre-shot routine in my mind is consistent, which means you do it the same way every time. It's productive, which means it's helpful for the shot that you're about to hit. And it's consistent and productive um, along three components. And those three components are your physical routine, that's what you're going to do. So I'm going to walk in, I'm going to aim the face, I'm going to look at the target, then I'm going to take my stance, and I'm, whatever you do, right? I'm not saying everybody's... If there were one best routine, every tour player would already be doing it. So it doesn't exist. But So physically, you're doing the same thing every time. It's consistent and productive. Because if you walk in and you aim 40 yards right every time, that's still consistent. That's just consistently unproductive. So you got to make sure that it's both. But Physical, visual, visual is how your eyes process the golf course. So a quick example would be you can look at spots or paths in putting, but you can't look at both on your last look like because one's a starting point and one's an end point, and that's going to confuse yourself. And then you have to have a consistent mental routine. And the best way I can explain a consistent mental routine is in other sports, the moving projectile, the basketball, the ping pong ball, the football is what occupies your mind. But in golf, the ball's static. And so you have to learn how to occupy your mind. You're not going to go blank just from sheer willpower. Uh, so if listeners have kids, don't tell your kid to just walk up there and don't think about anything you hit it because that's not possible. Your brain is built to soak in information. So the way I would um, think about it and I try to explain it is your brain's like a conveyor belt. So if there's a conveyor belt, you know, in a factory, well, different things happen at different points along that conveyor belt. So you got a piece of plastic and then it gets rolled into a bottle. And then after that, it gets shaped to where they have the bottom and the top. And then they put this wrapper on it and then they put the liquid in it. And so you're, everything has a specific thing that's happening at that point in time. And you can't put the top on the bottle before you put the liquid in it. That doesn't work. Right. So as you're going through your physical routine, you would need to have the same thoughts coming in the same place. So a real quick example is Nick Watney, one of my guys, he, he used to count in his putting. So he'd, he'd set the putter in with the ball and match up the line on the putter with the line on the ball and say one. He'd take his stance and count two. He'd look out at the target, three, back to the ball, four, back stroke is five, through stroke is six. So if we could magically cut open his skull and look into his brain, if we're supposed to see two, we're not going to see four. And if there's supposed to be a number, it's not going to be blank. It's very choreographed, and you don't have to count at all. Like if I count in my putting, my speed's terrible. But you need to have the same mental routine going on every time for the your different routines. Now, you might have a different short game routine than you have long game routine, but whatever that is, you're going to do the same thing over and over and over. And then what I teach is that as you do this routine, at the end of the routine, it hits the shot for you. Because I want players involved in the decision-making, like we were talking about Zach, but I, I really don't want them involved in the routine. I want them to have practiced the routine to the point where the routine kind of takes over and that's what's hitting the shot for them. And so really consciously, it feels like I just take this last look, I have this last thought, I take my swing, and then the ball's gone. You know, and the way Stuart Sink describes it is like, once I start walking in, I'm done. There's a great video of Tiger where he's talking about this, and he, he he mentions kind of what he does. You can find it on YouTube. Listeners want to go look for it. It's in the middle middle of one of his things that talks about his mental routine, Tiger, something, I don't know, whatever. And so 
but it basically is talking about him kind of, he, he knows he walks into a shot and then for all intents and purposes, he just kind of blacked out. And then the next thing he knows, he can pick up the shot and it's fallen from the sky, but he, he doesn't really remember getting over the ball and actually making the swing. So it's, it's pretty interesting. And I mean, he was decent, you know, so. Uh, that is true. <laughs> doing, doing something like that over and over takes repetition. It's not just something you can do off the cuff. How do you, do you recommend your players, you know, practice with their routine? How do you recommend them practice with it to make sure that yep. they bring it with them to tournaments and under pressure situations? Right. That's a great question. So we would, um, when you're first building your routine, you know, you probably want to get your teacher involved, or if you happen to work with a sports psychologist, get them involved or just a good player. You know, you can watch a lot of good routines on TV. Unfortunately, a lot of times they don't show them walking into the ball. You kind of just pick them up and they're already over the ball. But so you would start with your physical routine and develop that first. But then once you get the visual and the mental components in there, what I really advise players to do is one of two things is either to hit the same basic shot over and over. So if you're working on your putting routine, you'd hit the same four foot putt over and over and over and over. You don't even have to be at the golf course to do that. And technically, you don't even need a ball. Like, so one of the things that I'll do, if I have a junior player and he's paying too much attention to the ball and I'm trying to help him work on his routine, but he's caught up in the ball flight, we'll just go inside and get in the bay and I'll let him continue to hit the ball, but we'll hit him into a net where he doesn't get to see where it's gone. And so that forces him to focus just on the kind of pieces of the routine, right? And sometimes I'll have players be like, okay, hey, you're going to walk in and set up to this mark like a like a coin on the ground and go through your your putting routine but you don't get to hit the putt and then on the fifth one i'll let you hit the putt but so because your routine should be based off of what's comfortable at first not what produces results because if i let you go around and you know i said okay hey coop or daniel y'all just you know just try some different routines and hit different putts as you go around the green you would think well if i made the putt it must have been a pretty good routine and if i missed the putt it it must be a bad routine, and that that's not true at all, right? So, yeah. Have you ever had a player that has had a really bad tournament or just like a really big letdown? And if so, how do you guys work through that so that they can learn and be stronger for the next tournament? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, you're always just looking forward to the next challenge. And, you know, I mean... Part of it is just the perspective you take. And you, you have to realize that you go get beat up a lot in golf, right? My, my wife and I, we have this saying kind of, today I love golf. Or it could be today I hate golf. But, you know. And and, and I try to tell players, like, hey, you, you got to have the right perspective. If golf is the number one thing in your life, and I work with players that, you know, their livelihood depends on it. But if it's the number one thing in their life, they're going to, crash and burn at some point because they're, they're going to ride the emotional roller coaster, roller coaster of golf. And so you can't be living and dying with every shot. So, you know, I mean, in golf, hopefully you have another event to look forward to. I mean, sometimes you have a change of a season, like if you're in college and that might be your last chance that you could have gotten in the lineup. I get that, but then you'll play in the summer and, you know, so, but really you have to go back and say, okay, well, okay, what happened in this previous event? You know, was there any skills that let me down? If there were skills that let you down, driving or putting or whatever, then then what was the root cause for my poor performance? Because just because you perform poor in a skill, that doesn't tell you why you perform poor. Like stats at their most basic level, all they tell you is where the ball went. They don't tell you why the ball went there. So you might hit four balls OB right. And it could be because of a swing mistake, but it could be because you were scared of OB left. And it was just a really tight golf course through a neighborhood in Florida or something like that. And, you know, if, if it was the reason that you made a mistake was mental as the root cause, you can hit a thousand balls on the range and you're not going to fix that because you can never fix a mental issue through physical practice. But that's what a lot of players will try to do because it's easier on your ego. So, you know, we generally look at stats as a starting point, but we don't just say, okay, well, that automatically means I need to go work on my technique for that. We, we kind of go through a, a, a series of kind of checks and balances to figure out, because if you take one shot, let's just take a basic shot. We've kind of already talked about this a little bit, but the two things that happen prior to hitting a shot are I make a decision 
and then I go through my pre-shot routine. So the first two questions you should ask yourself after every poor shot is, well, was I committed to my decision? And then did I let the routine hit the shot for me? If the answer to either one of those is no, you can't assess the swing prior to the ball leaving or the stroke because those can be influenced by the tension from a no answer, no, I wasn't committed or no, I didn't trust my routine. And then tension gets into my body and that's what comes out and produces a poor swing. But it's, I didn't just make a bad swing because I made a bad swing. I made a bad swing because fear caused tension to get in my body and then I made a bad swing, you know, but we all blame the swing, you know, understandably because that's the last thing that happened before the ball left. So logically it makes sense. It just doesn't always hold true. So. Absolutely. And when when your players have that mentality as far as like, you know, I got I got to let let my routine hit the shop for me, as far as like fit, wrapping up tournament, et cetera, how do you have them track that? Is it like is there a method you have to say, hey, like, how do you keep it honest? Because a lot of times players will like finish up a tournament and it'll feel terrible at first, and then after a while, if they would take down if they write down things the next day, they've rationalized certain things and Try to make it feel better on themselves. How do you get them to be honest and also give you something that you can learn from? Right. Well, I do think it's good to journal if you have a really good round or a really poor round and and you're making notes and that sort of thing. But I actually have a scorecard, which I don't have to show you right now. It's back home in Sea Island, but it's basically a mental scorecard. And so it lists, you know, all the holes and then it has first shot, second shot, third shot, you know, approach chip or, or short game, first putt, second putt. So you can you can say what shot was poor. And then the root cause and and the options for root cause would be doubt, distraction, future worry. That's like anxiety or nerves, execution, course management, just golf. I could be but so there's like seven options, right? And so you 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 go down and you circle. So if you let's just say you hit a decent drive and you're only marking the poor results who so good pretty good shot, got it on the green, 30 feet, two putt. You would just put a check mark, check mark beside the first hole. Second hole, same thing. Third hole, you know, there's water right, so you pull it left of the green. Let's say it's a par three, and, and, you, and you know, okay, hey, I didn't really figure out what shot I wanted to hit, and so, you know, that was, you know, that was doubt. I know I had doubt. There's no reason to go practice on the range if that continues to show up. But So I would have them say what shot it was, what was the root cause, and then any notes, there's a little section for, like, didn't figure out what shot I wanted to hit it, you know, couldn't decide between, like, you know, a push fade or whether I was just going to hit it to the center of the green, and so at the last minute I panicked and I pulled it left. Well, that's mental. And so you would fill out this card at the end of your round. You just probably put it, put it away. You'd go out because you're, you're the, you might not have a lot of time. I mean, you might notice some things, but it's really meant for more of like the entire week. And then once that week's done, now we look at it and we say, man, you know, I didn't make that many mistakes with my irons and, and putting was pretty good, but I had seven T-ball, T-ball mistakes in three days. And, you know, one of them was execution, but six of them were either a doubt or distraction or so like, we don't need to go hit a lot of balls. We got to figure out something that's going on before that with your commitment or your routine. And now sometimes you will see a lot of ease where a player feels like, I mean, I hit my head the same miss. I felt like I'm looking up expecting to see a good shot and it's just coming out of the wrong barrel. Well, okay, that's execution. So now we can go work on that. But that's how we would do that on a kind of weekly basis is, I mean, we track it. Yeah, just like you would track other stats. Some we haven't talked about yet is nerves, and it's something that a lot of people struggle with in the mental game. And something I want to talk about is nerves that are off the course versus nerves that are on the course, because during the tournament week, you feel them wherever you are. So how do you help players deal with nerves off the course, and how do you help players deal with nerves on the course? Well, so off the course, I think first is just to realize that's normal and natural, and and you know, once you kind of get into the rhythm of the round, that just kind of naturally gets better or goes away. Just like playing football once you get hit or, you know, baseball. I mean, and all athletes, that's just a sign to your mind from your body that says, hey, this is exciting. This is fun. 
So it's really important that you interpret nerves the right way. And you don't equate, if I get nervous, I'm going to play poor. Because factually, that's just not true. You know? I mean, some people get nervous and play poor, but a lot of people get nervous and play great. And both guys coming down the stretch with a chance to win this Sunday, I guarantee you will be nervous. And that doesn't mean they're going to play awful, right? So so part of it is to understand it's very normal, it's very natural. Second is, like we said earlier, to have the right perspective on it. Sun's going to come up tomorrow regardless of what you do anyway. Now, you can do some things where you kind of lower your baseline. So that's where you get into things like meditation and breathing and and some other things that, you know, to be very honest, I know just enough to be dangerous. I know, you know, there's some things out there that my players even do to help them with that. Some of them have some quiet time in the morning and they do some reading to, to get their mind right. Some of them do some actual breathing exercises. You know, there's a company out there, NeuroPeak Pro, which maybe you've heard of, but they they do a lot of breathing and, and they have some, I think they're really good at that. So that can kind of like, settle you off the course. And then when you get on the course, then I think it's like accepting that as normal, inviting that challenge. And then there are a few things that you can do, especially in your long game, where if if you know you're feeling nervous, what I would have all, what I will have all my players do or remind them to do Thursday morning is, hey, before that first tee ball, take some really hard swings and get some of that energy out. Because the last tee ball you hit was maybe, you know, 10 to 15 minutes ago. We got to go from the range on the other side of the clubhouse, hit some putts, wait till it's your turn. And so that, that takes a while from your last ball. And so they would take two or three swings and I'm talking like 110 to 120%, like as pretty much as hard as you can swing and get that out. And that helps your tempo be better over the ball. And so then you have a tendency to make kind of a more normal swing because as this tension and anxiety and excitement is building up, if it comes out on your first full swing, if the face is square, it might be great. But if it's a little left or a little right, it could go pretty far offline, right? So, you know, and then I think you're always, what I want my players to be aware of, I want them to be aware of their breathing. I definitely want them to be aware of their pace, uh, of their walk. You know, one of the things that, um, in the note that I wrote, Zach, back in 2007, there were a couple of just basic reminders, which, you know, you would be like, wow, that's what you told him, really? Come on, man. I told him to walk slow all day and stay with his caddy because Zach has a tendency to walk fast. And if you walk fast, it has a tendency to get you going fast. And it's it's really hard to walk into a ball fast and then slow down once you're over the ball. And the other thing I told him was just reminded him to eat and drink. Because if he got to the 15th hole and he he needed energy, it was going to be too late. And that year it was really cold and it's hard to eat and drink when it's cold. Or it's harder than when it's hot. I mean, when it's hot, you naturally drink water. But when it's cold, guys could go four hours and never drink. And that's not a good thing. So, yeah. Agreed. That That's very insightful. And obviously, you've worked with a lot of really good players on your website. You know, it talks about the accolades that your players have received. You know, 29 PGA yep. Tour wins as of right now, four majors, et cetera. You also work with college players and... Uh, college teams what's yep. been what's the difference do you notice between you know college players in general and guys who are playing at a high level on the PGA tour and then also maybe some of the guys in between who are working their way there at different levels you see different things right and there are, there are college players who can be successful to be very honest hitting it 270 to 275 I mean the one thing one thing you see on PGA tour is a lot of length Okay, so there is kind of this prerequisite. It's kind of like, you know, I, I don't know, in, in football, you know, you have the 40-yard dash and you have these other metrics. I mean, there's really only one metric in golf, and if you can hit it, I would say the number is probably 280 now at the low, low end. If you can hit it at least 280 off the tee, it's going to be really hard on the PGA Tour. You might be able to succeed at some lower levels, but you got to be able to kind of do that. But, but once you get past that, and most – all, you know, 10,000 guys that are trying to play on the PGA Tour have that. You know, and then it comes down to your work ethic, your professionalism, a lot of how you manage yourself off the course. The biggest thing I see in terms of practice, you know, and what I see on the course is is the tour professionals 
are just way more diligent about their setup and the things prior to the motion of the club. So amateurs tend to get really caught up in their putting stroke and their golf swing. Pros get really insightful and really practice their putting setup and how they're standing and where their eyes are and where their hands are and where the ball position is. And, and they really pay attention to how they set up to a golf ball because they, they've made enough swings and they've made enough strokes that those things are fairly repetitive. And I would argue those things are even pretty repetitive at the college level, but they're setting up differently. And therefore, if you set up differently and you have any arc, let's just take putting, if you have any arc and you stroke and the ball position is off by half an inch, you're going to catch it in a different place in your stroke. So your start line is going to be different. And so that's, you know, I, I would say work ethic, and professionalism of how you go about your job and treating it like a job would be the biggest thing I see off the course or outside of practice. And then once we get onto the practice grounds and on the course, tour players are just way more diligent on pre-swing fundamentals uh, than amateurs are because amateurs, you know, take lessons. And, and I hate, you know, the best teachers are always looking at things before you even make the club move. Yeah, that's what I would say. Obviously, you work with college players, you work with professionals, but also know that on your website, it seems like since I, since I last look, it uh, looks updated a little bit and like you might have some video series out, et cetera, and some other things. So just tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. So, yeah. So basically during COVID, you know, in 20, I was like, man, I got to have a way to stay in touch with my guys. So I came up with this thing called a minute with Mo, which is just, hey, we're going to go back through the fundamentals of everything and we're going to start with this is a golf ball almost, right? And so every night for about 80 nights in a row, I, I did this one minute video and I sent it out to my tour players and some of my good amateurs and that sort of thing. And I'm like, and they really liked it. And so I'm like, you know, I think I, I should change my website, which was more kind of written based to like more video based. And so I basically reworked it. And the other thing is just the way things are going, you know, people rather look at something and watch a video and, 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 yeah, I've written some books and books are fine, but they don't really show you. And so I wanted to show people how to do a lot of the things we were talking about. So I, I created a video series. It's called the Score Better Video Program. And basically you get five to six videos a month. And then that starts your library and your library just keeps building. So right now, like I'm the first person in it. I'm 14 months along. And so I've got five to seven videos. So that's uh, whatever, 70 to 80 videos. And they're all like four to five minutes. It, it, it's just me explaining like something in your pre-shot routine or like how to process a shot after you've hit it or how to set up putting practice or an interview with Davis Love. So it's just, um, and the whole idea is retention because what I've what I found is when a lot of students come see me at Sea Island or, or when I go visit a college team, we have a fun experience and they learn some things, but then it just kind of will fade away. Well, if you have a video library to go back to over and over, then retention goes up. And if you're going to change your game, you have to retain the information so that you can change your game. So that's really what the the program's about. My website is Dr. Mo, D-R-M-O, learntowin.com, and it's the, the Score Better video program. And the first month is free, so you just go on and check it out and see if you like it. And, and if you do, just keep up with it. So That is really cool. I, I know something like that could be helpful. I was actually looking back at my 2015 practice journal. And I think that's what you said about video is so true because my journaling capabilities were not the strongest. My handwriting is also admittedly terrible. And so <laughs> those things combined meant when I would look back at my journal, I was going through it with one of our buddies on the corn ferry this weekend. I was like, man, like, no wonder I didn't learn anything from anything I'd ever done. Like, I didn't know what to do. And like, whenever I wanted to go back and fix things, um, I didn't keep a good enough record. And that came with like swing changes, et cetera. I didn't know what was happening. So having something like this, that you learn it once from you or learn it twice from you, and then you have something to go back, obviously sounds super cool. Beyond that, um, switching gears really quickly before yep. I get to my last question. We yep. talked about nerves. We talked about players and things that affect them on the golf course. But a as you know, like we're more than golfers. We're, humans with all sorts of different problems, all sorts of different upbringings. Yep. What do you do in situations or what sort of situations do you notice where like, hey, like, it's not just that somebody has nerves, like, because we all have nerves, but like, 
everybody's background plays into the nerves, why they feel nerves, what makes them feel pressure, et cetera. How do you notice that and work with players depending on where they're coming from? Well, I mean, if, if I know it's, you know, a relationship that has the potential to, to continue on. So basically that means an individual, not, not so much a group thing where I might just be presenting information, but if I'm with a student and they've come to see me, whether they're in high school or, you know, whether they're on tour, I want to know a little bit about their history, which means how they play and their, their stats. But I also want to know what other sports have you played? I want to know, you know, what else do they like? You know, especially when we get on the course, I'm asking them questions about what do they like to do outside and maybe asking them about other family members, if they feel pressure from their mom or dad, or if they have brothers and sisters that played, and, you know, so all that plays a part into it. And the way I think it, it plays into it. And, and this is without going too in depth, but I believe three things always produce a golf score. That's your own course thinking. That's what you've done in terms of practice and prep. And then your off course foundation and your, that's what we're talking about right now would fit on your off course foundation. And that, that could be physiological things like what are you doing in terms of sleep and, and eating and drinking. And then it could also, you know, go into, okay, well tell me about, you know, your past and things that have, uh, you know, gone on, whether they're performance related or not, is there anything that you think would be helpful? is usually the way I would phrase it. You know, I don't need to know everybody's, you know, um, past, and I don't need to know all the details, but, you know, if, if you played in a high school tournament and you had a four-shot lead and, and you lost this lead and it was the U.S. junior and, and it kind of crushed you and you've never recovered from that, well, well, that's important. I need to know that. Or, and I mean, I had, this is a situation that I ran across. I had a, a young lady, she played the college golf, and we got into this discussion and we're talking about, playing the event or playing the leaderboard or, or playing against other players in your group. And, and really what you want to do is play the golf course. And, you know, so I'm trying to get her and she said, Oh, I always know what I'm playing. And I said, Oh yeah, what's that? And she said, I'm always playing the phone call after the round with my dad. And so I have to address that. I mean, I could teach her the best routine in the world. I, I could really get her to practice the way I need her to practice. But if we don't address that and I don't address that with the dad, that, that's going to be a burden that is just weighing her down. And literally, it's like a, she's trying to play with a snake wrapped around her, squeezing the breath out of her. I mean, it's, it's not going to look pretty, you know? So that that would be kind of where I get into that. And, I, you know, I'm not a psychiatrist or a clinical psychologist. I, I, I know how to basically recognize things that I think are uh, of a more serious magnitude and refer those out. I don't treat those. But so that would be kind of where that falls, you know, in, in my professional experiences. I'm able to recognize things and, and get players help, and I've had that happen a few times, but that's a different issue than a performance-related issue. Absolutely. Well, we've kind of taken a holistic look at uh, psychology, sports performance, and we appreciate you walking us through that. The last question yep. we ask every guest is the same. It's going to be a two-parter for you because you work with juniors as well. So the first part is, if you could go back to yourself as a junior golfer and tell yourself just one thing, what would that one thing be? And then the second part is, because you work with juniors, if you could tell a junior golfer just one thing, what would that one thing be? I think if I could go back and tell myself, I, I think it would be to practice in a different way. I think I used to just do a lot of repetition. I didn't really know about mimicking play and, and going through my routine and, and that sort of thing. So think that would be what I would tell myself. I, I think I could have maybe gotten to where I broke 70 uh, if I spent a little more time in random practice instead of block practice. And, then I, and if I had learned to play the golf course different, once you know a golf course and you really know all the shots, then playing it from the same set of tees over and over and over just really isn't helping you transfer that to competitive golf. So I would definitely do that. And that's that kind of leads into what I would tell juniors. What I would tell juniors is, hey, once you're you know, 10th or 11th grade or whenever you can shoot 75 or better on a consistent level at your home course, quit playing your home course from the same set of tees. Like one day tee off at the tips and then the second hole move up and then the third hole move up. So by the fifth tee, you're at the ladies tee. And then the next day go out and start on the first hole at the ladies tees and work your way back. And so that one day this hole is 130 and the next day is 220. And then, so you're always making yourself 
utilize course management because what I see with a lot of juniors is they play the same course at home over and over and over, but that means they're not forced to use any course management skills. And it also means that they know pretty much what they should shoot. And I want to get them to learn how to play one hole at a time. And and by doing this, by changing tees every hole and really mixing it up and playing games out there, it, it helps your game get more transferability in it so that when you go to competition, you're better prepared. Because I have people tell me all the time, all my kids shoots under par all the time at home. And I'm like, okay, well, that's good. But that doesn't necessarily mean he's a great player. I mean, one, you may have an easy golf course. And two, you know, once you know a golf course and you know all the reads and all the breaks, and then that there's limited value in that helping you transfer. So that's what I would say. Absolutely. Well, we appreciate you taking the time. Tell us where uh, our listeners could find you on social media and also remind us about your website, where they, what yep. they can do there and how they can learn more from you. Yes. Yeah, so it's pretty easy. Um, the website is Dr. Mo, D-R-M-O, learn to win.com. And then you just, you can go through and look at all the pieces of it. But really the thing that I think listeners would be most interested in is this score better video program, which is kind of on the homepage at the bottom. You go sign up. Uh, you can do it as an annual basis or a monthly basis. Either way, you go get the first month free and and just keep building your library. And then I also do some things on Instagram. It's the same name, Dr. Mo, uh, Learn to Win. I put up posts uh, myself kind of Monday and Thursday. Usually I may not get to them like when I'm traveling like today. And then uh, I have a lady who helps me out and, and kind of takes some stuff from other places or videos I've sent her or, you know, uh, juniors that I'm working with. So in tandem, we put that up and that's where you can find all the info. Awesome. Be sure to give Dr. Mo a follow and go to his website. As you've heard here, he's got a lot of really cool things to say and a lot of things that you can definitely learn from. If you're listening to us on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, please subscribe and leave us a rating. If you're listening on YouTube, please like and subscribe. This helps us get our message out to more people. And if you're trying to find us on social media, you can find us on Instagram at the tournament code and on Twitter at tournament code. As always, we appreciate you joining us. We look forward to diving in deeper to what it takes to play elite tournament golf.